Shabbat Shalom. Everyone. Uh, I don't know if you know about the latest news in the Middle East. Uh, you know that Turkey broke ties with Israel, and yesterday it expelled the Israeli ambassador. But we knew that this will happen, right? In fact, we knew it 2,600 years ago. You know, this is just another escalation leading to the final hours that the Bible prophecies tell us. It, was, it is actually in Ezekiel chapter 38, who identified the nation of Turkey at the end of this age and says that along with Russia and Iran and other smaller countries will attack Israel. You know that this never was fulfilled in history and now the time is, re is ripe for the fulfillment. Remember that in June of last year, these three countries began meeting together. They met for security reasons, they says. This is one of the first meetings that will bring them close together and afterwards, as Ezekiel says, to fight against Israel. Now, by the way, does that make sense? You know, do you realize the size of Turkey and Iran and Russia put together and the size of Israel? It just doesn't make sense. I want to tell you the reason is because it is a spiritual battle more than anything else. Physical and as well spiritual. And this, they will realize it at the end. And this here, we read that a major in, uh, from the Israeli forces, General Kovachi, he addressed the Knesset Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee just last week. And for the first time, he says that Tehran can produce nuclear weapons within one or two years. So things are shaping up. I want to tell you, the, the Messiah, Yeshua, will be coming very soon. And in two years' time, the revolutions in the Arab countries that we are witnessing right now will have subsided. And it is then that I believe that they will turn their attention to Israel one more time. You know, thank God we have our Bibles to tell us that God is sovereign. God has promised in Amos, remember chapter 3, he says he, God does nothing. He does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servant, the prophets. These prophecies are frozen in time. They are there. Next week, in fact, we're going to start looking at the prophecies, especially about the countries that are around Israel, as Jeremiah himself is going to speak about Egypt and all these countries, Lebanon and Syria and so on and so forth. But for now, let's go to this great section I find of Jeremiah chapter 44. You can turn your scriptures to Jeremiah chapter 44. And I want to ask a question. Could there be a time in one's life when a person finally refuses to hear from God? Would it be the time when an individual says it is enough? I heard enough. I don't want to hear about God anymore. Even after being exposed to the influence of the Spirit of God for a long time, and after hearing the words of God over and over, could it be that one may come to the point of declining that important offer of salvation? You know, this is a sad reality we're exposed to in these last chapters of the ministry of Jeremiah. We have seen how the last kings of Judah behaved before the destruction of Israel, of Jerusalem, that is, in the temple. How volatile and stable and selfish they were at the expense of the people. But after the fall of Jerusalem and the burning of the temple of God, you would think that many will turn to God, seeing that every one of his words were fulfilled. But no, they don't. The saga continues. Man definitely does not learn from history, even when this history was still present with them, when its ravages were still being experienced. Now, I want to tell you, I understand why God promised a few chapters before that he will put his spirit in us who will dwell in us to direct us and to teach us because without him, without him dwelling in us in permanence, we are what the scripture says in Isaiah 53, 6, we are like sheep going astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, our own way, which is the opposite of God's way that is downward. Now we can appreciate why the Messiah needed to come to be wounded for our transgressions. Because without him and the Spirit of God, we would be lost forever. This is the message of the last section of Jeremiah's ministry. Let me bring you to this passage in this book that really marks a finality. Jeremiah 44 verse 16. 
After these words, I want to tell you, Jeremiah speaks for the last time to the people of Judah. And we do not hear from him anymore, nor do we know what happened to him. See what the people finally say. It says, as for the word which you have spoken to us in the name of Jehovah, we will not listen to you. But we will certainly do whatever has gone out of our mouth. This is how Jeremiah's pleading with Israel stopped. After 46 years of earnest preaching, they finally said, we will not hear your word. The subsequent chapters are no more addressed to them. They are addressed to the nations of the world, who in their own way also said, we will not listen to you. There they are also judged. This section of Jeremiah, I want to tell you, is another Matthew 12, where we see the final rejection of the Messiah, and where in Matthew 13, he speaks about the kingdom of the church itself, of the kingdom of God. And this is how the ministry of Jeremiah ends. We do not know what happened to Jeremiah afterwards. There's a Christian tradition that Jeremiah was stoned to death by the Judeans in Egypt. There's another tradition from the Jews that says that on the conquest of Egypt by Nebuchadnezzar, he and Baruch made his escape to Babylon and died there in peace. But we don't know. As we do not know what happened to Paul or most of the prophets of God. But one thing we know is that God takes good care of his own. This is what we're going to learn today. And we have seen what he told this Ethiopian, what God told this Ethiopian who risks his life to save Jeremiah from the pit. you remember last week? God remembered him and promised him great blessing because he helped Jeremiah. And this is not all. You know, there's a full chapter, chapter 45, only five verses. Wholly given as an encouragement for Baruch, the scribe. Baruch also came to a point in his life where he must have been discouraged. But the Lord remembers his works and how he helped Jeremiah and he blesses him. Look, see what he says in verse 5. Jeremiah 45, 5. He says, and do you seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them. For behold, I will bring adversity on all flesh, says the Lord, but I will give your life to you as a prize in all the places, wherever you go. God says, I'm going to protect you wherever you go. And if today we still have this book of Jeremiah after 2,600 years, it is because there's hope. There is salvation in God, no matter what happens around us. And the subject matter of this section is a continuation of the last one we saw last week. What Jeremiah does, what more time, is to expose the truth about the condition of the heart of man. Condition of man without God. This is what is sad, by the way. Our life without God, but with him, I want to tell you, there's salvation, there is joy, there is peace, and there's a great future. Let us go and see what happened after the Babylonians entered the city of God and destroyed it. Let's read chapter 39, verses 1 to 3. Chapter 39, which is a breaking point in here. It says, In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and besieged it. In the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, on the ninth day of the month, the city was penetrated. Then all the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate. Again, if you're looking to write a book or make a film on alien invasion, here are some suggestions for names. Look at the rest of verse 3. And it says, Nergal Sharetzer, Samgar Nebo, Sarsechim Rabsaris, Nergal Sharetzer, Rabmag, with the rest of the prince of the king of Babylon. These were the new leaders of the city of God, of Jerusalem. The city that God says, I will dwell. What follows in this chapter shows the cruelty of these Babylonians. After that, they caught Zedekiah the king, who attempted to flee. See what they do to him. Look at verse 6 and 8. It says, Then the king of Babylon, that is Nebuchadnezzar, killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes in Ribla. The king of Babylon also killed the nobles of Judah. Moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound them with bronze fetters to carry him off to Babylon. 
And the Chaldeans burned the king's house and the houses of the people with fire and broke down the walls of Jerusalem. Since this time, I want to tell you, Jerusalem never really recovered. While some say that Jeremiah's Jerusalem today lies buried from 30 to 100 feet below the level of this present city, Jerusalem rose so many times for the many attempts to completely destroy it. From Jeremiah 39 to today, Jer Jerusalem has been besieged 46 times. It has been completely razed to the ground 17 times, but it always resurfaced. Today, there are billions of people and many nations and countless of religion within Christianity and Islam that claim ownership. This city is sometimes called the navel of earth. It brings together Asia, Europe, and Africa, where the majority of mankind live. And the reason why so many are attracted to Jerusalem really is found in that verse I want to show you on the screen, Ezekiel 5.5. 5. Where God says, this is Jerusalem, I have set her in the midst of the nations and the countries all around her. Jerusalem is the center of the world as far as God is concerned. And no wonder that the last event in the history of man will be played right there. And this is the place from where Jesus will begin his messianic times. He will be stationed there. No wonder the forces of evil want to obliterate this city. They have tried again and again, but it will always resurrect until it would be called the New Jerusalem or the New Jerusalem will come and dwell in this very place where God and the believers will abide forever in eternity. What a history, right? So much suffering, but at the end it will be the most glorious place in the universe. Let's now go back to the time of Jeremiah and see how this city was left to itself. Now, let me briefly tell you what happened then. You know, after that, the Chaldeans deported many people. It's estimated that the population of Judah at this time was about 300,000. And only a population of maybe in the tens of thousands or maybe less was left there. After this, the Babylonians left Judea into the hands of a man called Gedaliah. They chose this man perhaps because of his ability to rule, but that created another problem because there was another man, a man called Ishmael, who was a direct descendant of David. This man felt that he should have been the next ruler, so he makes a pact with who? The Ammonites, the enemies of Israel. We haven't heard from them for a while, in fact. So to support, with the support of the Ammonites, Ishmael kills Gedaliah, and with him, a few Babylonian, Babylonian guards that were left there. And then he takes the remnants of the people captive to the Ammonites. And here's another attempt of another diaspora, and also another instance of selfishness, where man puts his own interest at the cost of countless of people. Now, it is then that a man called Yohanan, that is John in Greek, Yohanan, a hero, he goes and frees the people and brings them back to Judah. But the story doesn't end there. And this is when a serious problem arises. Remember that many of the Babylonians' guards were, were killed. So this man, Yohanan, was afraid of reprisal. So he and the people go to Jeremiah. And they ask Jeremiah to pray to God and to ask God what they should do. That was, by the way, very wise. Let's read how they ask God. Look, go, look to Jeremiah 42, 1, 2, 3. It's very moving, at least at first reading. Jeremiah 42, verses 1 to 3. It says, Now all the captains of the forces, Yohanan the son of Kareah, Jezaniah the son of Hoshea, and all the people from the least to the greatest came near and said to Jeremiah the prophet, Please, let our petition be acceptable to you and pray to us, to the Lord our God, for all this remnant, since we are left but a few, as you can see. That the Lord, your God, may show us the way in which we should walk and the things we should do. And then they swore, they would swear that whatever God would say they would do. Look at verse 5 and 6. 
And they said to Jeremiah, let the Lord be a true and faithful witness between us. If we do not do according to everything which the Lord, your God, sends us by you, whether it is pleasing or displeasing, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we sent you, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. You see how willing and how sincere they are? And God, by the way, readily answers them and tells them not to be afraid of the Babylonians. And he promises them blessings, of course, if they stay in Israel. Look at verse 11, just one verse where you can see part of his answer. He says, do not be afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom you are afraid. Do not be afraid of him, says the Lord, for I am with you to save you and deliver you from your hand. And he especially tells them not to go to Egypt, but... Men will always be men. They actually go to Egypt. They completely forgot about their promises and about what God said, and they go. They do not follow God's answer and go to Egypt. And not only that, Yohanan kidnaps uh, Jeremiah and Baruch and all the people and brings them all to Egypt, another diaspora, because one was not enough. See verse 7. Of Jeremiah 43 that's the last stroke if you want and they went to the land of Egypt for they did not obey the voice of Jehovah and they went as far as Tahat Pinhes how can men change so fast they were so willing and seemed so sincere and then they changed for no apparent reason they even do you know that they accused Jeremiah to have listened to Baruch I know, how did they get this story? We have no idea, right? So they began to make up stories to sustain their unbelief. In truth, like the last kings of Judah, they wanted to hear what they wanted and nothing else. And when man doesn't want to accept something, he creates stories, he creates new interpretations of the scriptures to sustain what he wants to believe. As Yeshua said in Matthew 26, 41, the spirit indeed is willing. We have seen how willing they are and how they swore they would make it. But Jesus says, but the flesh is weak, so weak that it controls them and it made them do silly things. This, I want to tell you, is a great expose of the two natures that dwell in us. And looking at the story as a whole, you know, there's an irony right there. The irony of it all, it seems that only the Babylonians understood what actually was happening in Israel. Did you notice the wise words of this man, Nabuzarandan, to Jeremiah? Look at chapter 40, verse 3. You know, this guy, Nabuzarandan, I think was a theologian or something like this. Look what he says. He says, now the Lord has brought it, speaking about the destruction of Jerusalem, and has done just as he said. Because you people have sinned against the Lord and not obeyed his voice, therefore these things has come upon you. I mean, how did he know that? How did he know that the Lord has said it before? How does he know about sin? How does he know about obeying the Lord? This man, this man reminds us of the other Babylonians that came 600 years later, and they said, hey, where's the king of the Jews? They knew it, but the people there did not know it, and no one could answer them. How did these people know what the Israelites were completely out of it? And why did this Nebuchadnezzar had such a soft spot for Jeremiah? Remember last week we saw this? How nice he was to Jeremiah? You know, let's pause for a minute and try to figure out these Babylonians and what they understood themselves and how did they get the knowledge of all these things? You know, Nebuchadnezzar came to be so nice to Jeremiah. While the text does not tell us why, we can dig in in history and find something, actually. In fact, I believe that Nebuchadnezzar changed of heart. And their knowledge, the Babylonians' knowledge of the God of Israel came from the same source as the wise men's sources. What was the source? Daniel the prophet. You know that Daniel the prophet, that this man must be the only reason why Nebuchadnezzar ordered a good treatment to Jeremiah. Remember the events of Daniel 2? There Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and asked his wise men 
not only to give him the interpretation, but the dream itself. He said he forgot. And who was the only one able to give him the dream and the interpretation? It was Daniel, the Jewish young man. And after this, Nebuchadnezzar was so impressed that he elected Daniel to the equivalent of prime minister of Babylon. But when did this happen, by the way? What was the date of the dream? Actually, Daniel's Nebuchadnezzar dream happened 17 years before the destruction of Jerusalem. Daniel 2 begins with a date, and it says now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, and we know it's 603 or 604 BC, and we know that the destruction of the temple happened in 586 BC, some 17 years later. By this time, Daniel was prominent in Babylon, and one, he could not stop the destruction of Jerusalem, surely he must have used his influence for Jeremiah, whom he knew. He must have told Nebuchadnezzar, remember that dream and the interpretation and how you wanted to revere me? Well, this man, Jeremiah, is like me. He's a prophet of the Most High. That must have scared Nebuchadnezzar not just a little. This is why I believe he was so nice to this man. And furthermore, Daniel must have used his influence to make the lives of the Jews in Babylon more comfortable. See that Jeremiah was right when he told the Jewish people, don't go to Egypt, but go to Babylon. Why? Daniel was waiting for them right there. In fact, the Jews became so comfortable in Babylon that 70 years later, with Ezra and Nehemiah, the majority didn't want to come back because they were so comfortable. In any case, the real message here is that God is our father. God is the father of his children, and he will take care of his children no matter what. Now let's go back to Jeremiah 44, 16 and see the reason the Israelites gave for not believing, for not believing in God. That also, by the way, is surprising. Let's read verses 16 to 18. Again, verse 16, he says, As for the word that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen. But we will certainly do whatever has gone out of our own mouth to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings to her, as we have done. We and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem, for then we had plenty of food, we were well off and saw no trouble. But since we stopped burning incense to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything and have been consumed by the sword and by famine. I mean, do you realize what they're saying here? They are accusing God for their sin. They are accusing God for their downfall. The Israelites then made this mistake to this many believers often make. They judge God in accordance with the condition of their lives. They judge him in accordance on how much he gives them. Have you been in a situation when a person is actually guilty, obviously guilty of a great sin? But as the time goes on, as the conversation goes on, he becomes the accuser. And he says, it's because of you. It's because of the church. It's because of everything that I did it. This is what they're doing here. They're accusing God. You know, while we can experience great blessings in our lives, God, I want to tell you, never promised you a rose garden. Remember that? And if you are, we are going through a difficult time, it is not because he does not care or because he's not here. There are many reasons for our sufferings, but it is surely not because he's not present. And by the way, who is this queen of heaven? You know, who is this queen of heaven these people seem to love so much? You know, she's mentioned five times in the book of Jeremiah. This so-called queen was venerated all over the Middle East, by the way, and beyond, and through different names. She was the established religion. So if so many people believe in her, so it must be good, right? This is perhaps how they thought. She is known as Astarte, the ancient Semitic deity, identical with the Babylonian Ishtar or Venus, right? She was the fertility goddess of the Canaanites, as we see it in 1 Kings 11, and of the Sidonians in 1 Samuel 31. And do you know that today... The Queen of Heaven is a title Roman Catholicism wrongly attributes to Mary, the Mother of God, as they said. 
Mary is the mother of the humanity of Jesus, not of the, the deity of God. She is not the mother of God and even less a queen of heaven. This is so unbiblical. And so people can find a thousand and one reasons for not believing and a thousand and one gods as a replacement for the God of the scriptures. Jeremiah sums up the destiny of man when he is so far from God. And this is in the book of Lamentation, by the way. The book of Lamentation was written when Jeremiah was in the pit, when Jeremiah saw so many people being killed also. In Lamentation 1.9, I want to read it for you. He said, she did not consider her destiny, therefore her collapse was awesome. She did not consider, the one word in the Hebrew, right? Zakar, that means she did not remember, remember because she knew there were so many things said to her. She forgot completely the history. She forgot the promises of God and collapse was awesome, it says. But I want to tell you, before we condemn these people too much, let's admit that God's people do not always listen to the words of God, right? Like these last Israelites who swore to Jeremiah that they will follow God's answer, how often we make promises to the Lord when we're in tough times, only to repudiate them when they do not concord with our expectations. Heal me, we ask the Lord, and I will be the best believer in town. And when we are well, we think that maybe it was all in our heads. It was we're going to be healed anyway. Or grant me this prayer and I will do this, this, and that. And when it comes, we turn our back to God. It is true that we live in an era of unkept promises. You know, nations today sign important treaties and then break them at will. Today I hear that the courthouse is so busy with people who sign contracts and later renege. And worse, it is busy with those many couples who show little regard for their wedding vows. More and more believers divorce for unbiblical reasons and they remarry. When one of them after divorcing said to me, it is not fair and it is cruel that I'm not able to marry, to remarry. After that, he divorced his wife. You know, this man has broken a covenant that now, and now he speaks of fairness. He has forgotten the promise of the wife of his youth, as God calls her. This, what is cruel. In this kind of society, you know, if there is one type of people that should keep their covenant and their promises, it should be the believers. You know, because if you go and preach the word and preach Jesus, how are they going to believe you if you don't keep your own covenant? In C.S. Lewis' biography, we read how this man took this truth so seriously. You know, he was determined to pay, to pay what he had vowed. His biography tells us of the suffering he endured for so long because he kept a promise he had made to a friend of his during World War I. You know, this friend was worried about the care of his wife and small daughter. If he should be killed in battle, so Lewis assured him that if that were to happen, he would look after them. And as the war dragged on, the man was killed. True to his word, Lewis took care of his friend's family, yet no matter how helpful he tried to be, the woman was ungrateful. She was rude, she was arrogant and domineering. Through all Lewis kept forgiving her, he refused to let her action become an excuse to renege his covenant with his friend. So he kept his word, and maybe this is why today we know and we hear again of C.S. Lewis. You know, as James says, James 5.12, let your yes be yes, let your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. But I want to tell you, I want to ask you, why are all these things given to us in this place in Jeremiah? Again, we could have had chapter 33, then right to chapter 39, and then chapter 46, and finish with the end. Why so much about the nature of men? You know, I want to tell you, in order to fully grasp the value and the, of the death and the resurrection of Yeshua, we need to know how bad, how selfish, how silly Men can be. Philosophy today says that man is essentially good. That he is inherently good. If you listen to these philosophers, you don't need Jesus. 
You will not see the need of the action of Yeshua on the cross. Psychology brings in the human factors of heredity and environment. And they contribute unlimited possibilities to what you can do with men. If you follow this psychologist, you will not see the need of Yeshua. Even religion in general tells you that you can be good, so good that your good deeds will win you heaven. If you believe this, you don't need Jesus. You know, all this human saga we see in this chapter of Jeremiah could be summed up with a psalm, actually, that is very good. Psalm 143, 146, 3 to 5. It says, do not put your trust in princes, in men, nor in the son of man in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, he returns to the earth. In that very day, his plan perish. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. This is what I believe the intent of this chapter is. The message is that we cannot put our trust and remit our eternal future into the hands of a man. We need the Messiah. These men, Ishmael and Yohanan, are men like us. We are all made of common clay, and that is why we all have the same problems. There is no originality with sin and with evil. It, refers, it comes back that is always in the same way. It was Albert Einstein, who was not a Bible believer, by the way, who said, he said, with the discovery of the atom, everything changed except man's thinking. Because of this, we drift towards unparalleled catastro catastrophe, end of quote. And the answer to that is the Messiah and in what he did for us. This, by the way, is the gospel according to Jeremiah. And in this book, the breaking point, do you remember? The descent, the breaking point, the descent into captivity began right in chapter 36. From the cutting and the burning of the word of God by the king. From there on, it all went down. And the outward rejection also of the people of Judah. And put together, this event reminds us so much of those that we find in the gospel concerning the life of the Messiah in his final hours. There's a correlation in there. There's a marked correlation. After all, I want to tell you, it is the same story. It is the same people in there. Let me point a few parallels between the gospel and Jeremiah. If you remember in Jeremiah 37, 11 to 13, we see that the prophet Jeremiah is arrested. But he is arrested for the same reason that Jesus was arrested, for treason, same accusation. When the religious leaders delivered Yeshua to Pontius Pilate, they had finally came out with an accusation, as we see in Luke 23.2. When they said, we found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, the king. The accusation was sedition against Rome. The accusation against Jeremiah was sedition against Judah. You are defective. He said, defecting, that is. You are violently falling away. You are deserting, he says to the Chaldeans. They accused him in Jeremiah 37, 13. And we read in verse 15, if you are in Jeremiah 37. It says, therefore the princes were angry with Jeremiah, and they struck him and put him in prison in the house of Jonathan the scribe. Jeremiah and the Messiah were both accused of sedition, which is an incitement of resisting to an insurrection against the lawful and to authorities, the authority of fallen men. Furthermore, verse 15, they beat Jeremiah just like they beat the Messiah. And in another instance, in Jeremiah 38, 4, they condemned Jeremiah to death. Because like the Messiah, both were seen as a nuisance to the country. See what they said, Jeremiah 38, 4. They said, please let this man, the prophet of God is speaking about, let this man be put to death, for thus he weakens the hands of man of war who remains in the city. As they said to Jesus in Luke 23, 21, crucify him, crucify him. But he was the word of God that just came to them. It was the same people. 
We also learn from Jeremiah 36, 5 to 6, that Jeremiah could not anymore go to the temple because they wanted to harm him. They didn't want to hear of him. The same with the Messiah in John 7, 1, where we read after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. Why did he have to walk in Galilee in the north? It says, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the religious leaders sought to kill him. Now, did you know that when Ishmael killed Gedaliah, he also killed all the people that were with him, it says, right? In Jeremiah 41.3, in Jeremiah 46. It says in Jeremiah 41.3, it says Ishmael, Ishmael also struck down all the Jews who were with him. That is, in, with Gedaliah a mitzvah. But did you know that Jeremiah was there too? This is exactly where Jeremiah went. We learn from Jeremiah 40 verse 6. Where was Jeremiah? We don't know. You know, that reminds me when they wanted to kill Jesus, you know, in John 10, 39. At this time, did you know there were hundreds of eyes fixed on him? And there we read in John 10, 39, therefore they sought to seize him. He escaped out of their hands. Where go? We don't know. Well, we don't know where, what happened with Jeremiah. Maybe he was out or something. But one thing we know is that God took care of him. God took care of him. And did you notice what the Babylonian, the Babylonian Nebu Zarandan gave Jeremiah? He gave him three gifts. Jeremiah 40 verse 5. He says, so the captain of the guard gave him ration, rations, gifts, and let him go. That is ration for food, material gifts, and freedom. Three gifts. These three gifts, like the wise men who came the same area. And both Jeremiah and Jesus, after this time, were brought to Egypt. Of course, these gifts could not have been the same. The Messiah's gifts were gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold is a symbol of kinship. Jesus is the king. Frankincense is a symbol of deity. Yeshua is God. And myrrh is the symbol of death and sacrifice. Yeshua is the final sacrifice of sin. But for Jeremiah and for us, these gifts received are all that we need in this life for now. Ration for food, material gifts, and freedom so we can work for God. But most importantly, did you notice also that they put Jeremiah into a pit? This is very significant here. While the intent was to kill him, of course he didn't die. The pit bore in the Hebrew in many passages is synonym of Sheol. As David says in Psalm 30 verse 3. It says, O Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the bore, to the pit. And even Isaiah says in Isaiah 38, 18, those who go down to the pit cannot hope for the truth. This is synonym of Sheol, where Jesus went. But what is this pit that Jeremiah was sent in? Depending on your translation, the translation of your Bible, you may have the word cisterns, hole, dungeon, or well. The pits or unused wells were usually pear-shaped reservoir having a relatively small opening on the top and larger hollowed area, right? And when there was just a little bit of water, this water will become like mud. And we read at the end of Jeremiah 38.6, he says, so Jeremiah sank in the mud, in the mire, right? Because there was a lot to it. And what happened there, Jeremiah tells us in the book of Lamentation. And this is where we see that some of his words may also have been the words of the Messiah when he himself was in Sheol. Turn to Lamentation chapter 3. By the way, Lamentation is was seen as the one book with the book of Jeremiah. It's really in the whole of chapter 3, which has 66 verses. But let's just read verses 4 to 6 for now. Since Jeremiah speaking, he says, He has aged my flesh and my skin and broken my bones. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and woe. He has set me in dark places like the dead of long ago. Jeremiah could only have written this word when sent into the pit, into that dark place. Was he sent there so that he could experience a fraction of what the Messiah experienced so he can write these things to us? As David suffered in the hands of Saul and wrote the Messianic Psalms, especially Psalm 22. Like Joseph, who also was thrown in a pit and whose life typifies so much the Messiah. 
So Jeremiah suffered in the pit and wrote these words, words the Messiah could have said as well. See again verses 52 to 54. It says, My enemies without cause hunted me down like a bird. They silenced my life in the pit and threw stones at me. The waters flowed over my head. And I said, I'm cut off. Cut off as the Messiah was cut off. The same word in Isaiah 53, 8, when it says that he was cut off from the land of the living. Jeremiah was almost cut off. But the Messiah had to be cut off so that we may have salvation. But what is beautiful, and this is where we come to the practical application of all that Jeremiah suffered, really. What is beautiful in all this is that even in the pit, even in utter darkness with death looming around him, Jeremiah found hope. Look at verse 55 to 57. I call on your name, O Lord, from the lowest pit. You have heard my voice. Do not hide your ear from my sighting, from my cry for help. You drew near on the day I called you and said, do not fear. Do not fear. God spoke to him, even in the pit. And this is where the Lord comes in full force, when we are in the pit. And Jeremiah was never left to himself in the pit. Look at again verse 21 to 23. Can go up. He says, This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. Through the Lord's mercy, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I mean, how can he speak of mourning when he was in a pit, in darkness of a pit, and sing, Great is your faithfulness? This is where God often meets us in the oven, as with, the, as with Daniel's friends, in the lion's den as with Daniel, and in the pit, as with Jeremiah. He may allow us to fall into it, but he will always be there to strengthen us. Remember, he did not save Daniel from the lion's den. Nor did he save his three friends from the oven. Nor did he save Jeremiah from the pit. But he saved them in the oven, in the pit, in the lion's den. And notice something about the words of Jeremiah in this suffering. Jeremiah does not utter a word of vengeance. Nor does he endlessly accuse his God. Why? Because he was covered with love. You know, there's one verse in the Bible I want to bring to you, a verse we do not quote enough. And this is so true, especially in time of suffering and trial. Song of Solomon 8.6. For love is as strong as death. In the positive way. Love is God and he is way stronger than the worst evil. And in a time of trial, it is from him that we should draw our strength, which will result in love emanating from us. This will dissipate, I want to tell you, all darkness of hell, all bad thoughts. Jeremiah was no more overwhelmed with darkness and with the possibility of death. He was overwhelmed with love, with hope, with God. And he rejoiced even in the pit. This is what we ought to imitate. We ought to empty ourselves and be filled with him. The Bible tells us to be filled with the fullness of God, to be filled with the Spirit, to be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Such was Jeremiah in the pit. And what Jeremiah typified the Messiah in many ways throughout his book, him, like Moses and like David, he did fall. And his fall is there recorded for us so that our eyes should always be focused on the Messiah and never on man. Where did Jeremiah fall, by the way? You know, there's one verse in chapter 37 that may have escaped our notice. And when we stop at it, we may find Jeremiah's words quite surprising. Look at verse 20. As Jeremiah's life was in danger, he actually asked the king for clemency. It says, therefore, please hear now, O my Lord the King, please let my petition be accepted before you, and do not make me return to the house of Jonathan the scribe, lest I die there. Here Jeremiah is pleading the king not to be put back in prison. This may be understandable, right? Because Jeremiah was over 60 years old, and he suffered so much. But wait a minute, this is Jeremiah. Was not his life in the hands of God? 
Was he not preaching all along that God was completely sovereign? Why did he not turn to God? But he turned to the king, whom he knew was flimsy, was selfish and uncaring. And he ends, at the end, you know that he ends up being thrown, not in that prison, but in the worst place, in the pit. This is how he ended up in the pit. Has Jeremiah lacked faith and God allowed him to go to a worse place? You know, sometimes the punishment of a man of God may seem harsh to us, but they are proportioned to their faith. Remember Moses. Do you know, why did, Moses, why did God punish Moses? He did not allow him to enter the land of Israel. And yet he worked so hard. What pre precisely happened, by the way, in God's explanation is very hard to tell. There God had commanded Moses to speak to a rock in order to bring forth water from the people who were complaining against him. And uh, Moses does not speak to the rock, but hits it twice. And because of this, we are told that he actually did not uphold the Lord's holiness. But that doesn't seem to be such a great offense. And it is the only place, really, that it is reported that Moses actually offended God. We might say today, is that all, Lord? Just for that, you didn't let Moses to get into the land of Israel? And just because Jeremiah asked the king not to be sent back to jail, and you bring him to a worse place? I think the answer lies in what we read in Luke twelve forty-eight. I want to tell you, it says, For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. Moses and Jeremiah had reached a high level of closeness to God, and this was a relatively very great offense. But remember, he was with them all the time. You know, for Moses, he didn't go to the land of Israel, but what did he get? He got a personal tour from God of all the land of Israel. This is the next chapter. He brought him, he saw every single thing. And Jeremiah experienced God like really no one would have experienced God if he wasn't in that pit itself. And how did the Messiah react in a similar situation as that at Jeremiah? Yeshua never turned to the Romans and asked for a linear treatment or sentence. He turned to God, and we hear him say in Mark 14.36, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me, nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. He turned to God, and he turned to God only. And this is what Jeremiah learned in the pit, because there he learned to turn to God. And one last thing about Jeremiah, one last thing, a very important thing, is that he loved the people. Jeremiah loved the people he was called to preach to, so much that he felt their pains. This is what the Lord, I believe, is looking for as servants, as servant evangelists. Let me bring you Lamentation 3. 48 to 51, and see how he speaks. You know, we don't even know, really, if it's Jeremiah, if it's God, or if it's the Messiah. This is how close he was to God. He says, my eyes, verse 48, my eyes overflow with rivers of water for the destruction of the daughter of my people. My eyes flow and do not cease without interruption till the Lord from heaven looks down and sees. My eyes bring suffering to my soul because of all the daughters of my city. So much so, again, that we don't know who really is speaking here. As for us today, what shall we do with this information? How can we really prepare ourselves, really, to be servants of God, really, and to put in practice everything that we learn? You know, I do not know if you heard of the story of the wife who wrote her husband who was in prison for armed robbery. Asking him, when is the best time to plant the potatoes? Because he left and she didn't know what to do. So he wrote back and he says, don't dig the garden. That's where I hid my guns. All the mail going in and out of the prison was censored. And when the guards read that sentence, they sent out a group of men who dug up the garden from one end to the other, but didn't find the gun. When the wife reported what they had done, her husband replied, the garden is ready. <laughs> now is the time to plant the potatoes. Okay? I want to tell you, seed cannot be planted in hard ground. 
The ground must be spaded and plowed. The earth must be broken up so that the seed can be inserted in the soil and so that we can produce these fruits that we are called to produce in this life. I want to leave you with one verse. You know the book of Ecclesiastes? You know, there we find the meaning of life. Here we find the richest man on the earth. And he says, can we find riches in wisdom? No. In withdrawal? No. In weeping? In wine? In wind, he says. In works? In words? In weapons? In writing? No. He ends with this verse. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Let's bow our head in prayer. Oh, great and awesome God, Lord of God, Lord of heaven and earth. You who keep your promises, you who extend your mercy to those who love and obey you, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to us today. Hear our prayers as we confess to you that we are unworthy and sinful. And it is in realizing this weakness that we may see your face. Forgive our sins, O Lord. Search every heart here and convict us and convert us. May we return to you. May we keep your words and do them. May we be pleasing to you as we pray under the name of the one sitting at your right hand. Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. To get in touch with us, you can do so by telephone 1-888-685-5902, locally in Montreal, 514-685-5902. You can also reach us through our website at www.arielcanada.com. Again, the phone number is 1-888-685-5902 or locally in Montreal, 514-685-5902 website address is www.arielcanada all one word a-r-i-e-l canada dot com be blessed shalom